tablet. So you will have, you know, multiple pills and the patient can end up taking about... Second day, uh, for that explanation, you can actually see it is coming from an expert, somebody who understands the challenge we face and uh, has been in the trenches. Um, what other the ideas um, do you have on how we move forward, uh, the challenges you see, and how we can organize ourselves and stop agonizing, just like Dr. Mustafa and actually the Honorable Minister were advising yesterday. Um, any more hand up? Okay, um, the gentleman in front here. Are you tell us your name, where you're from, and keep it short, sir. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. Um, Martin Onyuti, um, working with a fellowship of TB survivors. Uh, yesterday, we had a good presentation, and uh, we heard about CAST TB, the work that CAST TB has done into the community with meaningful involvement of the VHTs. So VHTs are at Health Center One. Uh, it's my humble request that if uh, at that Health Center One, the VHTs could involve the TB survivors to move with into the community would be a better approach. Just, there's a say that if you want to catch a thief, also use a thief. So the TB survivors will be able to reach, they know the survivors, they know the patients, they know even uh, people who, uh, I mean, co the coffers in the community. So it's my request to the IPs and also the civil society organizations and also involvement of the expert clients who are attached to some of the regional referral hospital. We also request that uh, more uh, TB survivors to be trained as, I mean, to become expert clients and attached in all the regional referral hospitals and the general hospitals, including the public private clinics. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, from the TB survivors' perspective, I think it's a very crucial if they, are, if they can if we can work together, because in doing so, you fight stigma, but also you have information uh, from what they have experienced that can be helpful as we move towards 2030 in realizing our goal. Okay, um, some more views. Shortly, I'll be calling in uh, Dr. Raymond to uh, tell us who are going to be the session chairs uh, for the next session that we have. But at least I can actually see uh, Dr. Maureen Sekad is here. So maybe soon uh, she'll be coming to make her presentation because that was missed yesterday. But as we prepare for that, let us continue to share ideas amongst ourselves. Uh, I noticed that one big area that we have a, a big gap is the use of the molecular WHO rapid diagnostics. And uh, I think one of the, the if we, if we, uh, and I think one of the big challenges with that area is uh, the access to these molecular diagnostics. So I, I, I like the idea of having more uh, rapid diagnostics put to the lower facilities, like the health center threes. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, doctor. Um, I'm sure when she speaks, you take note and you can imagine in your own environment, how that affects you, how that's a, a challenge. We have uh, a hand up on the extreme left corner of this uh, conference hall. I am sure some of the things that are being expressed are not new. 
uh, and probably you agree with them, but if, where you find probably you don't agree or you want to make this, the submission better, you can add to what has been said because we just want to... Please keep up your hand again so that the person bring a microphone can see you. All right. Yes. Okay, we have two people there. All right. Yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Cohen from G2G Ginger. My question... Yeah. I would first of all want to take this opportunity to appreciate uh, the keynote speaker yesterday. He really, he really was point blank in his delivery on key things that are, are going on and key things that maybe we are not specific interventions. What works in Karamoja may not necessarily uh, work in the Acholi region or in Jinja. And this calls for us to really sit down, appreciate the communities that we serve uh, in order to tailor uh, those interventions. We have also gone a, a great mile in gathering data. Our colleagues from NTLP, uh, Aldo, uh, Jeff Amanya, have done a great job in rallying us up in getting community-based surveillance data, a GIS, and I feel we need to intensify not just the data collection, but using uh, this data uh, for the context-specific interventions in the regions that we serve. Thank you. Thank you very much. The voice there coming from Karamoja, appreciating the presentations of yesterday, and especially our keynote speaker, Dr. Mustafa. Okay, um, more ideas. We have a job to do. We have set a deadline and a target, and it's only seven years away from now. You know the challenges. You have ideas on the solutions that we could have, and uh, so how do we learn from you? What obstacles do you see? Okay, um, may I suggest Dr. Raymond to come and take over, sir, and tell us the session, session chairs we are going to have. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Patrick, for leading us through the recap for yesterday. Once again, good morning, uh, colleagues and uh, stakeholders for our TB engagement uh, today. Today we have a, a fully packed program, so we want to start. Um, we currently are, there's a, a meeting that is going on, a sideline meeting with the ministries, departments, and agencies of government on how we can engage them in uh, TB, in a, uh, the multi-sector accountability uh, framework for TB, to making sure that they mainstream TB, both in their workplace, but also in the uh, services that they do provide, and above all, making sure that they mainstream TB financing in the, in the government uh, system the way HIV is currently doing. So this morning, we have uh, our chair who is uh, not around, so I will step in for her. Um, I will step in and we'll have presentations from uh, Dr. Maureen Sekade, who will be presenting on the key policy updates. Uh, she had already started by that um, recap which she just made. We shall also have a presentation from Dr. Aldo on the impact of digital X-ray and TB case finding. We shall have a presentation on CAST TB integration. Uh, those are three. And then we shall have a presentation from Jasper uh, on the designing TB case finding uh, uh, pathway uh, using men, um, a participatory seeking pathway analysis. So after these four presentations, uh, we shall break for a cup of coffee. We shall discuss and then break for a cup of coffee. And then we shall be led into the next discussion, which will be chaired by uh, Professor Jolova, and we'll be discussing advances in TB diagnosis and then we hope that we'll have our colleagues from the Ministry of Gender to come in and make their presentations, as well as addressing T 
TB in adolescents, the missing opportunities to end the TB epidemic. So those will be our presentations before we um, move into the group discussions later in the day. So can I take this opportunity to call upon Dr. Maureen Sekade, our TB, pediatric TB advisor, and uh, uh, a, a, a team member of the national of the Ministry of Health National TB and Leprosy Program to make her presentation. Thank you. Uh, let her presentation be put up. Yes, good morning to you all. Good morning to you all. Chair, how do I control the slides? The, I, the ID team should come and help you. Okay, so this morning, I'm going to run us through um, some key policy Technology can sometimes uh, be complicated. Is it? Yes, so I'll be taking us through um, key policy updates um, under tuberculosis and leprosy. And uh, this will uh, span across the care cascade for TB. Um, right from uh, prevention, um, identifying people with TB, um, making a diagnosis of TB, um, treatment, and then lastly, leprosy. Does this work? Where do I point up? Sorry? Okay, so, um, so just as a brief background, uh, I will start with prevention. And uh, the first slide uh, talks about um, the broad strategies for preventing tuberculosis. Um, the first being uh, vaccines. We know that uh, we have um, the vaccine that prevents uh, severe forms of uh, tuberculosis that is given at birth. So this is just to emphasize that we need to sustain um, access to BCG vaccine, which is given at birth. The next um, strategy is uh, infection prevention and control. And uh, the current guidance has been aligned to the WHO core components of uh, infection prevention and control that also span through um, national level programming, guidelines, um, different strategies for monitoring um, the infection prevention and control activities, auditing. So I won't go into details, but what we know is that uh, we are currently aligned to the global guidance. Well, this is... Okay, so the other strategy is uh, referred to as TB preventive treatment. So here we use medicines to prevent a person um, from getting the signs and symptoms of TB. And uh, this person um, is usually high, uh, usually has a high risk for TB or has been exposed to someone who has an infectious TB. Um, the other broad strategy is a contact tracing. 
uh, where we look out for people who have been exposed to others that have infectious TB. Uh, we screen them for symptoms and signs, and then we manage them similar to what we did uh, during COVID. So I'm going to focus on uh, the use of medicines, also referred to as a TB preventive treatment. And I'll try to make it simple for, for some of us who are not in the medical space. So we know that um, the groups that are at high risk of TB are eligible for TB preventive treatment if they do not have signs and symptoms of TB. So what we are currently implementing is a people living with HIV and a household contacts under five. So what updates do we have in this space? We have uh, incorporated um, contacts above five years and above. So if any of us has been in contact with another person who has infectious TB, we will assess you for TB. If you do not have signs and symptoms, we shall give you medicines to prevent you from getting the disease. The other group that has been considered is prisoners because um, they have a high risk for TB and health workers, okay? So these are the groups that have been prioritized in the new update. When we go to identifying the people that should be uh, started on treatment, there are certain methods or tools that we have. We can screen for signs and symptoms of TB among the high risk groups. We can use chest X-ray to determine if someone has evidence of, um, of a TB and this is recommended for contacts of, of uh, people with TB, as well as um, adolescents and adults living with their HIV. The other is to test for TB infection. So when an individual is exposed to that disease, the germ gets into the lungs. So if, if uh, one has an, a very good immune system, they're able to contain the multiplication of that germ and the presence of that germ in the body is referred to as infection. So if for any reason that person's immunity is shaken or lowered, the germs will actively multiply and progress to disease. So when we use medicines, we are preventing um, the progression of for molecular uh, diagnosis, for, for laboratory diagnosis, I know Prof. Uh, Jolova will give us a detailed uh, presentation, but the recommendation is that molecular tests are the initial um, um, test for TB, and here we have uh, the gene expert. In addition to that, we have introduced a TB lamp, which is already in some facilities, as well as a true nut. For children under 15 who are not able to provide a sputum sample, we are now recommending stool as an alternative for sputum. And the idea behind this is that children, okay. uh, the idea is that children are not able to cough up the sputum, so they swallow it. And uh, with that, we are able to, to, to use stool to identify the TB germ. So for children who are not able to provide the sputum, please request for, for stool. And the country is rolling out um, the, the capacity building in a phased manner. We are done with the regional referral hospitals and uh, some district hospitals have also been brought on board. And we are recommending it for gene expert. So don't send the stool for other tests right now, what the evidence that we have is for gene expert testing. Um, so the others are existing. What I wanted to emphasize is a lateral flow lamb should not be used for HIV negative people, okay? Lateral flow lamb is for HIV positive individuals or people living with HIV, and it should also be followed by the molecular um, rapid diagnostics because we need to ascertain um, um, if, they, if it's a positive uh, test, we also need to ascertain um, susceptibility testing. So for treatment, um, this chart just shows us um, the current um, regimen that we are using. 
um, six months for both children and adults for pulmonary uh, tuberculosis, and then for TB that has spread to, to the brain or meningitis and bone TB, um, 12 months. So this is going to inform us uh, for the next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, the country has adopted, uh, and then for continuation phase, four months, duration of four months. And uh, we are fortunate that Uganda was part of that trial that uh, informed the world. The study was uh, done by Muju, and um, it's exciting for us that we, we are moving in that, in that space. Um, the other conditions, uh, so, so for infants that are less than three months, they are going to maintain the six months duration because um, TB in that age group disseminates fast and they are more at risk of severe disease. So those ones will maintain the six months regimen. Uh, bone and TB, um, uh, for bone disease, it has been maintained at uh, 12 months. So initial two, two months and then continuation of 10 months. For TB meningitis, in addition to the 12 months regimen, there's an option for six months, which is a rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethionamide, okay? So the E is not a thambuto, the E is ethionamide. So we need to um, take um, note of that. So for the shorter duration, um, in adults, the updated guidance has considered that, and at an appropriate time, the country will be able to communicate, uh, the Ministry of Health will be able to communicate on when the actual implementation will start. As I mentioned, the shorter duration for, for, the, for the adults has uh, different uh, pills. It's not a combined tablet, and uh, that will be um, a bit challenging uh, to, to implement in terms of uh, adherence. Okay. I, I pressed one. Okay, sorry about this. Um, so, so we shall be uh, rolling out um, um, in in a, in a in a few months' time. For drug-resistant TB, we have also taken on the shorter regimen, which is six months. And key to note is that these are tablets. We no longer use injections for drug-resistant TB. So for the adolescents and adults above 14 years, um, the first line will be um, what we call the BPAL or BPAL-M, which has bedaquiline, pretonamide, um, linezolide, and BPAL-M has amoxifloxacin in addition to, to the ones I mentioned. So if uh, an adult or adolescent is not eligible, then they will get um, either the modified shortened regimen or the long individualized. And then for children, we are considering a nine months regimen and a longer individualized regimen. So globally, there is no data currently um, supporting the use of uh, the BPAL M, which is at six months. For adherence, we have also adopted what we call um, digital adherence technology and um, for those who are at regional referral hospitals, I am confident you're familiar with the, the video-supported treatment. Um, and uh, we also intend to implement uh, the smart pill box. And this is an effort towards uh, improving adherence and uh, treatment outcomes. So for the video-supported treatment, um, the, the patient swallows the medicines and records themselves as they are swallowing the medicines and that signal is transmitted to a central point and we are able to tell uh, whether the patient has swallowed um, the medicine or not. For the smart pill box, whenever the patient opens the smart pill box, a signal is sent to a central point and that is uh, captured as um, a medicine that has been uh, administered. Um, Okay, so the next uh, 
is uh, we are also uh, providing uh, guidance on additional areas, um, including uh, TB and malnutrition, TB diabetes. Uh, mental health is now uh, a critical component in TB care. Um, also TB and uh, tobacco use. And uh, we are also uh, providing uh, policy um, guidance on post-TB lung disease. And what the evidence shows is that even after completion of cure, uh, people who have suffered TB remain with residual, um, residual problems within their chest. So guidance will be provided on assessment as well as uh, management. So the next uh, is uh, related to leprosy, where um, we, we include um, guidance on a diagnosis of leprosy, which should be um, concrete, it should be confirmed. And uh, here we emphasize the need to identify an area of loss of searing uh, Dr. Stavia's presentation. Um, some might present with thickened or enlarged um, nerves with uh, loss of uh, sensation or muscle weakness. And it's important that uh, AFBs are identified in, a, in the slit skin smear. So the treatment is uh, six to 12 months we use three medicines, rifampicin, um, dapson, and clofazimine. So in terms of prevention, we know that BCG, to some extent, um, prevents uh, against leprosy. But what we now have is um, administration of single-dose rifampicin or rifapentin uh, following enhanced uh, contact management and screening. So for all identified uh, people with leprosy, we recommend enhanced uh, contact screening and management, and then uh, single dose rifampicin is provided um, to, to those that are eligible. And we hope that uh, in the future, TB will get to this point where we administer a single you know, dose preventive treatment. That will be the best and uh, probably sort out uh, the, the challenges that, that we have. That was the, the last slide, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Maureen, for giving us the updates, both at uh, uh, WHO level and at national level, in terms of where we are going. So, uh, stakeholders, next year, when we meet again, let's uh, ask us whether we have actually moved in that direction. Next, we are going to hear from Dr. Aldo Brua on the impact of digital X-ray and artificial intelligence in TB case finding. This is another innovation that uh, the TB program has introduced uh, in, 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 in this country and uh, we have been implementing this for some time so probably Aldo will dive us into what over to you Dr. Aldo. Dr. Aldo Brewer is uh, our advisor on uh, case finding in TB, and uh, he's a, a reputable TB uh, person for over more than seven years now in TB management. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, as my presentation is being loaded, I just want to, uh, first of all, uh, acknowledge uh, that this presentation uh, is the work of uh, the team at the national program, but specifically, uh, I and my colleague uh, Didas Tugumisi, uh, I don't know if he's around, uh, he coordinates the mobile clinic activities, and we made this presentation together. Uh, we are going to talk about the impact of uh, digital chest x-ray uh, fitted with artificial intelligence, that is computer aided detection, uh, to improve tuberculosis screening and uh, case detection in all. Okay, I'm still waiting for, uh, for it to be loaded. I'll just give a brief uh, uh, background about uh, chest x-ray. 
as you all are aware, uh, that uh, the Ministry of Health uh, has put in place a number of interventions to improve tuberculosis case detection. And uh, following a recommendation from uh, the WHO about the uh, use of uh, digital X-ray uh, with CAD technology, This one is back. Okay. And this one is positive. Okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you and welcome back to uh, the presentation. I was just giving a brief uh, introduction to the presentation that the WHO recommends the use of uh, digital chest X ray. Uh, with computer aided detection for screening and triage for tuberculosis disease. But we all know that uh, we have limited access to these technologies at our uh, health facilities for various reasons, including uh, inadequate functional uh, X-ray equipment, uh, supplies are also limited, and also shortage of trained personnel who can operate these technologies. So uh, since 2020, uh, the government of Uganda uh, through support with, from various partners, acquired uh, portable digital X-rays. At the moment, we have uh, 17 in country, and they also acquired uh, mobile clinics. So these are different sets of uh, systems, but also but they are all chest X-ray based. So the mobile clinics, uh, as you see in the picture above, are basically the mobile trucks which are fitted with chest X-ray and gene expert for same day screening and testing diagnosis for TB and treatment initiation. And then we also have the portable uh, digital X-rays, which are uh, backpacks, which are packed basically in those small uh, bags you see down over there, and the equipment is assembled uh, at convenience uh, to serve the purpose. So this equipment we are deployed at health facilities to support screening, and also we use them for community outreach, uh, targeting the TB hotspots and communities at high risk uh, of TB. So this is our uh, rollout of the digital X-ray technologies in the country. Uh, since 2020, uh, we have rolled out this equipment in these different locations, uh, which are pointed, uh, as you can see, in the map of, of, of the country. Uh, we first acquired five systems, and those are the facilities where they were deployed. Then in 2021, uh, through support from BMZ, we also acquired two uh, systems which were deployed in, in, in those two facilities. And then in 2022, we also acquired five additional systems uh, through support from USAID, and these were deployed in those five facilities. And right now, uh, through support from Google Fund, we have acquired five additional systems which are uh, in the process of being installed. Uh, already we've identified the facilities where they are going to be deployed. In addition to the portable X-ray systems, we also uh, acquired the five mobile clinics. Uh, these clinics are at the moment stationed at the center, but there's a plan to uh, hand them over to the regions. Already three regional referral hospitals have been identified where we are going to hand over these mobile clinics probably before the end of the year or early uh, in the beginning of the, of the year, next year. Uh, in consultation with the senior management of the Minister of Health because they are the ones to do the handover. So how are these X-ray systems used? Uh, this is our eligibility criteria uh, for use of uh, test X-ray. Uh, we are saying that at facility level, for purpose of screening, where test X-ray is available, 
we should perform chest X-ray examination for individuals seeking care at the health facility as a rapid screening test to exclude active TB disease. Uh, but we also know that there are individuals who are at high risk for TB. For example, the people living with HIV, the diabetic patients, uh, malnourished people, uh, refugees, and, and also tobacco users. Uh, these ones are at high risk for TB. So irrespective of symptoms, they are actually should be prioritized for chest X-ray screening in order to identify active TB disease in these populations. And then, uh, as our criteria, uh, once you examine your chest X-ray and you have abnormal chest X-ray, now chest abnormality is defined uh, based on the uh, CAD technology, the computer aided detection technology, using a score ranging from zero to 100. So any person with a score from 50 and above is considered to have an abnormal chest X-ray, and such uh, individuals are sent for uh, further confirmatory tests using GeneXpert. And this is the algorithm that we deployed at these facilities uh, for purpose of screening for uh, using the chest X-ray. And of course, individuals in the hotspots and the hotspots. So as part of the uh, program support, uh, these are some of the activities that we uh, carried out before uh, as we implemented the intervention. Uh, one of them is, of course, conducting user training. Since this is a new technology, we had to identify clinicians and radiographers and train them uh, in, the, how, in how to use the uh, test X-ray system and also, of course, radiation safety, given that this equipment emits uh, radioactive material. Then uh, we developed and disseminated uh, standard operating procedures and tools for X-ray screening and diagnosis. And then we also conducted planned and conducted community screening outreaches. Uh, you will see from the picture above that this is one of the communities where uh, uh, the screening was conducted uh, using the mobile clinic. Uh, but also, uh, in the picture below, we also use the portable uh, backpacks uh, to conduct screening outreach. You can see this is actually uh, a, in a church. Uh, this is the space in a church to conduct a, an outreach. Uh, so we are able to take the services up to where the uh, people, the, the, the beneficiary of services uh, can be found. But in order to imp strengthen implementation, we conducted support supervision and mentorship uh, to address uh, challenges uh, in terms of capacity and also to improve the use of these tools. So this is the data uh, which has been uh, uh, compiled from the sites that have the portable digital X-ray machine. Uh, over the last three years, uh, of course, uh, you can see that in 2020, there are still 2021, uh, this is when the systems were just, uh, we still had a few of them, so there are a few people who were screened. But uh, in the last year and, and this year, we've seen registered an increase in people accessing the screening services. So overall, we've screened in the last three years 21,000 uh, people cumulatively using the portable chest X-ray. And out of that, uh, 1,000 uh, individuals uh, were diagnosed with TB. Of these, uh, uh, 600 were bacteriologically confirmed uh, with gene expert, which is uh, about uh, 50, this thing has gone blank. Is it power issue? Or? Maybe I use my, okay. <laughs> but I'm not seeing that presentation. We were seeing, we were seeing Aldo. I <laughs> want to see the presentation I also want to see, I don't want to see myself also. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so this, the system is back, so uh, IT, Although we are seeing him like <laughs> okay, continue. Okay, yes. So uh, out of the diagnosed patients, uh, 603 are bacteriologically confirmed, which is 56 percent. These were started on treatment. So uh, we are, that's a, a yield of about 55 percent of the people who are screened for TB, uh, which going by standards, uh, uh, we actually expect one uh, percent of the people screened to be what? 
diagnosed with TB. So we are seeing with chest X-ray, it's actually higher yield. When I say 1%, I mean 10% of those screened should be uh, presumptive for TB, and of those, when you screen them, uh, when you examine them, uh, I mean in the laboratory, test them, 10% should be uh, uh, diagnosed with TB. So it makes it at, uh, gives us a target of 1% of the total who are screened. But with chest X-ray, we are seeing a higher yield as a lesson from this intervention. So I, I did a, another quick look at the, at the contribution of uh, chest X-ray screening to the overall notification in the districts where these X-ray machines are placed. So these are the districts where the, the portable X-ray machines are placed, and these are the estimated TB cases uh, from these districts. 8,000, this is for one year. And out of these districts, they actually notified up to more than 100%. You can see 9,500 uh, overall cases. But looking at the cases diagnosed from these facilities contributed to about 8% uh, of the overall case notification. So this being uh, from one facility in the district, I think 10% is a significant contribution from these facilities. So it was a way of trying to demonstrate the impact of the intervention on case notification. But of course, we also see specific uh, facilities uh, where which have really significantly improved, like Maratha Hospital. Uh, I mean, in terms of overall notification in the district, uh, we see Kabong, uh, Kagadi, and the Isinziro, even apart. Um, although they haven't met their treatment coverage, but the contribution of the facility to overall notification of the district uh, is what uh, is uh, significant. Now, the other data was for uh, the portable chest X-ray systems. Now, this is uh, data from the mobile clinics. So we, uh, we have not combined this data because there are different systems operating in different uh, settings. The mobile clinics are mainly used in community screening. And this is what we have seen uh, over the period of about, uh, this is data for about uh, 18 months of using the mobile clinics. Uh, we've screened a total of 28,000 uh, people and out of these, uh, 1,700 are found to have abnormal chest X-ray. Samples, uh, interestingly, were collected from not only people with abnormal chest X-ray, but from all individuals who are able to provide the sample. So it's uh, uh, quite bigger than that. And out of that, we've uh, diagnosed a total of 500 uh, uh, patients, uh, uh, individuals with TB. Of these, 407 are bacteriologically confirmed, which is about 79% of uh, PBC. And this is where I started uh, on treatment uh, promptly. So this is a breakdown of where the screening outreach, uh, mobile clinic data, uh, where the screening was done uh, by population. Uh, if you see that uh, among the Fisher folks, uh, the total yield of TB from the Fisher folks was 4%, which I think uh, was the highest among the other populations. Then the uniform populations also had some 2% uh, yield. Prisons, 3%. Uh, yes, and, and as the list goes on. So uh, what we are learning from screening with mobile clinic is that uh, congregate settings such as prisons and fishing communities uh, have higher TB yield. And this should be prioritized for community TB screening. So uh, I know we keep getting requests, uh, we want a mobile clinic, we want a mobile clinic, but uh, we also I uh, really want to see uh, value out of the intervention uh, in terms of yield. So uh, these are the populations that we shall be prioritizing for our community screening activities. So the overall impact of chest X-ray, uh, when you combine data for both the portable chest X-rays and the uh, mobile clinics, is that we have screened uh, about 50,000 individuals uh, with this intervention. And out of that, we've diagnosed about 1,500, almost 1,600 people, which is about 3% of the overall people who were screened with this intervention. This data, actually, when you look at our national data for screening, uh, we find that our screening yield is about 0.2.5%, uh, basing on symptoms. But from chest X-ray, we are seeing a yield of 3%, which is more than, I think, 10 times uh, uh, what we are, we are seeing from symptom screening. So indeed, the intervention uh, using use of chest X-ray with AI uh, contributes to a high yield and what uh, improved uh, case identification. There are lessons that we have learned uh, 
Uh, one of them is that we see higher yield of TB from screening in health facilities compared to community screening. But of course, this is a uh, self-explanatory because the people in hospitals tend to be more sick and uh, compared to those we find in the communities. So what we are trying to say, the message we are passing here is that where these systems are available at facilities, let's make use of them. Uh, they are uh, sick patients in inpatient wards, especially in the medical wards, who would benefit from this intervention. Uh, people living in HIV uh, who are in, in care uh, should be prioritized. Diabetic patients, uh, malnutrition wards, all these individuals should be uh, offered the services in order to improve case identification uh, in, in this population. The other uh, lesson we have learned is that there's high yield of TB among tobacco users, people living in HIV and contacts. So we try to look at the different populations who have access to chest X-ray and Yes, uh, I was trying to point, but my point, I don't see it. But if you look there, you see that uh, the, of those who were screened, the majority were actually contacts. That bar in red is for contacts. And then the one in green, uh, refugees. And the one in brown, uh, the PLHIV. But they are the ones who had the highest number of what? Uh, the highest number of, of cases identified. Uh, so uh, if we are to prioritize screening, these are the populations we should really what, uh, target for, for our screening interventions. Can wind up? Yeah. So uh, as I conclude, uh, of course there are some uh, challenges, uh, but these are systems uh, gaps which we are addressing through the uh, implementation. One of them is the issue of uh, the personnel. We have uh, uh, some of the X-ray si sites do not have qualified radiographers, but we've tried to overcome this challenge by uh, training clinicians. Uh, because the, the system is easy to operate and also is based on the AI, uh, it can be operated by any healthcare worker. So we have trained clinicians to actually operate the X-ray machine to overcome that challenge. The other challenge is about uh, delays in obtaining gene expert results uh, from X-ray screening. Remember, chest X-ray is not a confirmatory test for TB. It is a screening test. So we still need gene expert to confirm TB. Uh, but whenever samples are sent, a uh, data management system called uh, SAM, which is basically screening analytics management. Uh, we are now rolling out this system and building capacity of the healthcare workers to use it to address the issue of data management. So I would like to thank you so much for listening and, and, uh, and acknowledge uh, Minister of Health, uh, the Global Fund, uh, USID, CDC, BMC, which provided us with these systems, and also the district health, uh, health teams and the beneficiaries of care. Thank you. A round of applause for Aldo. Thank you very much, Aldo, for leading this uh, innovation. And uh, I believe that going forward, definitely, we shall expand it to all uh, the districts. Please keep your questions uh, for Aldo and for Maureen. We shall now quickly move to another innovation that the National TB Program has introduced over the last year. Uh, integrated cast TB plus. Uh, Amanya Joffrey will make that presentation on behalf of Omundu Wawansi, Muzamiru Bamroba, uh, the man of the people who has held the fort for, for cast TB. So over to you, uh, Jeff, for this presentation. You have 10 minutes. Please keep within that time so, so that we can have enough time for discussion. As uh, Dr. Jasper mm -hmm. prepares to come uh, and also make a presentation after. It's not yet ready. Yeah, so they are trying to upload uh, the presentation. Can you also upload Jasper's presentation so that we do not delay? You okay. can go ahead and... Uh, <laughs> uh, Jeff is a, an epidemiologist within the National TB and Leprosy Program, a man who has been tracking 
all our TB cases around the country with an interest in making, letting us know where these cases are and how do we go deeper to find more of these TB cases, especially in the hotspots. Mm -hmm. Jeff has been at this for more than uh, also seven, eight years, mm -hmm. and he continues to make the surveillance team, epidemiology team, stronger and stronger by the day. Mm -hmm. Jeff, over to you. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, for those uh, the humble introductions. Yeah, so uh, I think you forgot to say one thing. Uh, why we do surveillance uh, is to ensure we have an evidence-based programming where, where every decision is evidence-based on the data we provide. So as a program, uh, our mandate is to ensure that we have uh, where we are sending a mobile van, there is a reason as to why we are sending a mobile van. The data tells us there is a hot spot, and that's where the burden is. So that's part of the reason as to why we institute uh, surveillance uh, systems to ensure they provide uh, evidence-based uh, programming. Uh, Yeah, so I'll be presenting uh, this on behalf of uh, Muzamir. Uh, Muzamir has been, uh, actually the community team, uh, not Muzamir, he has been the champion of uh, the community activities. Like we said, this answers our key strategic objective, number one, uh, to ensure we have reach, uh, we reach out to every person in the community. Evidence or data tells us that uh, the patients are not, they are not here, they are not here with us, they're in the communities. So with the evidence we get uh, from the data, we think the community systems should be able to provide guidance on how we can reach the last patient in the communities. Uh, kindly the IT team, uh, let me know if you're ready. Want the presentation, not the microphone. Okay, uh, Chair, they are trying to upload the presentation. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, the IT team. We appreciate. So basically, what we are looking at is building resilient and sustainable health systems for TB, leprosy, in the context of public health uh, emergencies. Cut off. He has the, I hope he has the, Jeff, yes, you have the system there. No. Uh, the pointer? I the pointer. Have, I don't have. It's with you there. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Okay. <coughs> it is there. Okay, thank you. This is just a summary of uh, the cast model. Uh, we shall be highlighting the cast model, uh, the goal and strategic documents. Thank you so much. Uh, the cast uh, intervention, 
we shall also look at the achievements and uh, the geographical coverage of this case. Yeah, so the background to this is uh, we know the agenda of the Global uh, Health Initiative, and for many institutions, uh, the agenda is to, like I said, is to make sure we reach out to the most high burdened uh, areas to find uh, TB. So also under the National Health Strategic Plan, which we know is a people-centered document with uh, the leadership mandate that provides uh, oversight to development partners uh, to support the integration of uh, the communities and also other activities at national level. So this national strategic plan is a document which provides guidance in line with uh, how, if we are to integrate, how are we going to, to integrate. So this also looks at, uh, we shall also highlight the lessons which have been learned uh, from the implementation of the CAST uh, TB, uh, which we did previously in 2022. So the CAST uh, TB Plus campaign was largely focused on what we saw from the CAST uh, TB, which happened from 2022, uh, September and March, I think. So the ministry, so the National Strategic Plan also goes further to provide uh, guidance in line with ensuring that Ministry of Health uh, make strategic decisions uh, to integrate our key community activities. So CAST Plus, uh, which I'm going to highlight uh, today, has demonstrated future opportunistic uh, opportunities to expand community interventions while leveraging uh, from other disease uh, programs. So such as malaria, MNCH, WASH, community, and uh, family planning. Yeah, so what is the CAST model? What were we doing under CAST, under the CAST Plus? So the CAST Plus model was designed by the NTLP, and we know that it was based on the CAST, which was a very ambitious, innovative approach, whose purpose was to catch up with the missed uh, community uh, diagnosed, community TB uh, patients who were out there in the communities. So the purpose was to identify these patients, uh, start them on treatment, but we also demonstrate uh, a system strengthening capabilities. So this model of collaboration and care uh, involved managers, highly technical trained health workers, uh, which triggered the general community to, to take action uh, in line with uh, instituting the CAST model, CAST plus model in the communities. So the model emphasizes uh, an intensive mobilization and sensitization approach for awareness decision, number one. Number two, the model emphasizes the screening of community members uh, on, on for TB disease. Then the model number three addresses testing of all the presumed uh, individuals for TB disease. Number, number five was to provide or to have provision of preventive services to the community members. The number five and last is uh, to ensure those that we have identified, have we started them on treatment? With, are they, those who are eligible for the preventive therapy, are they getting uh, the therapy? So this was uh, the CAST model, which under the guidance of uh, our assistant commissioner, we said we should uh, uh, take on, but in an, uh, an integrated approach. So the CAST model is provided oversight from these strategic documents. So in the morning, someone asked a question, how has TB uh, gone uh, concerning uh, integration with other TB services. So as a ministry, we have uh, the National Development Plan 2021-2025, which uh, clearly highlights the need to have integrated uh, uh, services at all levels. There is a, a Ministry of Health strategic plan, which also spells out the need 
to have resilient systems, responsive systems, and patient-centered uh, health systems. The NC, the, our NSP uh, that runs up to 2025, also with the key strategic objectives like we are seeing, also highlights the need to have integrated services. And since we are integrating with uh, other diseases, the Uganda Malaria Reduction Strategy, the revised copy also talks about integration, and the National Health, the National HIV and AIDS Strategic Plan also highlights this. The major purpose for these documents is to ensure we have uh, an improved uh, health outcomes for the citizens. So yes, the cast model was informed from an integrated uh, point of view. So why did we do uh, cast plus? So we had, as the ministry, we sat and saw, we realized we had fragmented systems and unmet uh, health needs. You wake up every morning, malaria drives to the same region, TB goes to the same region, HIV goes to the same region. Fragmented systems. So we thought if we implement the cast model, we should be able to answer the, the unmet needs uh, from the community or people who are consuming uh, our services. Number two, there was increased comorbidity, increased medical problems. Uh, we last, yesterday we highlighted, uh, our assistant commissioner highlighted around 30% of the TBHIV co-infected TB patients. That translates to that translates to one in 200 HIV patients having TB as well. So where there are 200 HIV TB patients, one has TB. So we thought if we integrate the CAST TB model, we are able to reach out, uh, identify uh, more uh, TB patients when we integrate with, uh, for example, HIV. Symptom screening, environmental assessment, can be simultaneously done. So all this was trying to, to integrate into CAST uh, Plus to ensure we reach out to other areas which we could have missed. So the objectives were to optimize the use of resources by leveraging on the synergies and efficiencies and also the economies of scale. So you have these resources, financial human resource, how do we synergize all these resources to ensure we implement one activity. That was objective number one of the CAST TB, uh, CAST TB Plus. Objective number two was to create a clear and shared understanding of the health service delivery purposes, the scope and the outcomes among the program team and the stakeholders. So it was very important to have a clear understanding of what the scope was, uh, what did we want to reach out to, and uh, what do we want to deliver when we integrate? The objective number three was to improve the quality and consistency of the program outputs, program outcomes, and impact in line with the Ministry of Health standards and criteria for the, the indicators we always monitor as Ministry of Health. So these three objectives were the reasons as to why we said we have been implementing the bigger cast, how, how and why then do we need to integrate with other programs? So the strategies uh, that we used to implement the CAST was to have the house-to-house -house, house -house visitation by our community, uh, our community members. So the VHTs who are our community members, they had their tasks to mobilize and sensitize, to do symptom screening, relay information to the household members, obtain and transport sputums uh, to household, to the health units, linkage of identified uh, patients to care, and distribute uh, the one pager, the IEC, on TB, or if we're integrating with HIV, on HIV, nutrition, MNCH. So these were the roles of the community members, and I think this spells out the reason as to why we need to have uh, the community systems integrated into our Ministry of Health Systems. The strategy number two was to have a community outreach that is, like I said, evidence-based. Identify hotspots so the health workers were taking lead. 
So this was a district-led implementation activity. So the district, the health workers mapped out the hotspots, uh, congregated settings, the slums, the schools, the parks, and the district leadership engaged the local leadership for, you know, for the venue, for mobilization. We had instances where we are even getting resources in terms of airtime from the RDCs, the cows. we appreciate. Then the strategy number three was contact tracing. Evaluate all the TB contacts for TB leprosy disease and those, and those eligible, we start them on TPT. So this highlights the key elements that we undertook under the CAST TB integration. So we have so we had sputum collection and transportation. Uh, clients who had positive results, they had to be referred for care, that is for TB, for HIV. So we had initiation of treatment for uncomplicated uh, cases and also referral for complicated cases for those who, are screened, those who had undergone screening for malaria. We did a uh, nutrition assessment, uh, highly malnourished, uh, those who are identified as highly malnourished were also referred to the healthcare as you see there. So the integration covered uh, the TB. So under TB, we are screening for cough, uh, fever. We obtained the sputum samples. Under HIV, we did uh, those who are presumptive for TB were also screened. We also did uh, the testing, the self-testing under HIV. Malaria, we screened for fever. Nutrition, mark, wash, availability of safe uh, water and environmental uh, hygiene and sanitation. MNCH, as you know, uh, pregnant women, uh, are they attaining ANC and immunization for children? So it was quite a comprehensive package that was uh, covering uh, these districts. So we identified in each of the regions, we identified districts to champion the cast. TB integration. So as you see in the West Nile, we have those districts and they were spread out across the country. So the coverage was reaching out 14 districts under the CAST TB plus implementation. We reached out to 3,000 villages, 108, 923 households were reached out with a message on HIV, on MNCH, on TB. Number of individuals reached out, 326,000, and number of individuals reached out with a basic message around 320,000, as you see on the right. So this was a very important, uh, a very important coverage uh, in line with this integration. So, like the chair said, uh, what are the some of the gains we saw uh, from the CAST uh, Plus campaign uh, implementation? So, like we said, across the regions we implemented in, the number of patients who were initiated on TB were 332 in just 14 uh, districts in a period of five days, uh, members. Yeah, then also well the number of sick children under five confirmed uh, there were 700, 7,000, as you see here. Th then uh, 34 were presumed TB cases. Oh, sorry, the total is not. We presumed around 26. We presumed around uh, 28,000 uh, 85 we analyzed around 20,000 samples and uh, the number of patients with confirmed uh, uh, TB in laboratory, around 381, uh, 356, that is 96% of the patients were started on, were initiated on treatment. So under HIV screening and testing, uh, we identified uh, through the self-test 141 uh, individuals uh, we are reached out to, and through following our algorithm, 90%, rather 90, were confirmed. And 100% of the 90 
we are started on treatment. So this spells out uh, how we are able to have gains under HIV through this integration. So for TPT, for TB contacts, 70% of the 1,103 eligible TB patients were started on TPT. I know this is below the 90% coverage, but at the time of the reports, it was 70%. Those uh, eligible uh, PLHIVs are started on TPT. Uh, it was at 12%. Okay. Sorry. So we also extended out to malaria. Under malaria screening, we identified uh, through RDT, we identified 60, we identified 7,000. Children and 63% of these uh, were confirmed under RDT uh, through the integration with malaria. Uh, 407 of the cases with severe malaria were referred uh, for care to the nearest health facilities. So proportion of children with severe malaria, they were 5.5%. So under WASH integration, so we did WASH, and I think this is a key message uh, that we picked out through uh, the district leadership that we think we can take home, 62% of the households, 62% of the households had latrines. Some areas like Moroto, 15%, uh, Terego, 52%. And the other interesting metric that we looked at was uh, number of households with drying racks, 47% had the drying racks. These are key metrics that help us understand the people we are serving. Under MCH integration, percentage of pregnant women attending ANC, as you see in blue, was averaged around 90%, 90 to 94%. Percentage of children with up-to-date immunization status by year one, as you see in the orange, they were at 100%. So we made gains not only in TB, but in MNCH, in malaria, and nutrition. So under nutrition, uh, through the CAST uh, TB plus integration, 12% uh, of the 55 under 5 uh, with the red mark were referred uh, for care. The number of pregnant women screened for mark 4,000. 104 of these uh, pregnant women and lactating had a yellow or red mark. So you can see these are varying within districts. We have Chukube having the highest with the red mark. We have uh, Terego also affected most under the nutrition assessment. So still uh, during the presentations, I think from day one, we also had a question on the cost of cast. So how costly was the implementation of the, this cast, the cast, wind up. the integrated cast? Wind up, wind up, wind up. So we looked at two districts and uh, Buyende. So as you see on the left, it shows the cast plus for Buyende. On the right, it shows the cast cost for Buyende. So just to highlight that... Uh, the coverage in Buyende being 30%, it cost around $19,000 uh, to implement CAST. 11% of course was going to uh, coordination that is in Buyende. So for, that was for CAST plus. For the CAST, 8% was going to coordination, 10% uh, was going to community, and it also cost around uh, uh, $2,000 uh, to implement uh, the CAST. Uh, for Buyende. For Kitigum, you can see the picture, and also for the cast venture. So, what are some of the lessons we learned from implementation of Cast Plus? We saw that leadership uh, is key for success when we are implementing Cast. We also saw implementation through, through the existing structures provide a platform for ensuring a very high scalable and sustainable results. So we think as a program, if we continue implementing uh, through these 
integrated structures, we're able to reach out to a wider audience. Investment in human resource is key, especially for the field teams. We have seen how uh, the cost was varying uh, in line with engaging the communities and what it took to implement this, this cost plus. Communities are receptive to integrated service where we received an overwhelming welcome uh, from the communities in line with implementing CAST. So we also saw that there is need to have adequate com com commodities and redistribute them uh, throughout the country where there, was where there was shortage. The district led coordination was very important, not forgetting the engagement of all the stakeholders in implementation of this CAST. The other thing uh, that came out was uh, stock out of com commodities, especially RDTs, the oral quick, uh, self-test, the gene expert cartridges, all these were noticeable when we were implementing this uh, cast plus. Limited human resource, in some areas we had limited support uh, from the partners. So the other lesson was we need to lobby more uh, for partner support increase the number of days to implement the CAST Plus activities for integration. We need to have and redistribute commod commodities to all the areas where we shall be implementing this CAST. So the next steps that, uh, Chair, allow me to take us through the next steps for the CAST TB. Uh, I might not have that time, time up. So we are just one minute. We are finalizing the toolkits, that's number one. We are scaling up CAST Plus beyond the pilot districts. We are exploring opportunities to deploy more digital X-ray, uh, the cards and mobile X-rays. We are exploring how we can use the CAST Plus data to inform the burden of TB and estimate the burden of TB yeah. at country level. Our prayer as the ministry and as people who are implementing the CAST is we need to embrace, adopt, and implement the integrated CAST Plus initiative in all communities at all levels. We engage community health workers, okay. Okay. the VHTs, work with CSOs, health facilities uh, to integrate outreaches, and we also need to support the implementation of the CAST Plus during the next, actually that will be the next CAST Plus in March 2024. Uh, Chair, this concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another round of applause for Amanya. It is three minutes to, am I audible? Please, please, please. Hello? Yeah, thank you. So we, we, we have one more presentation. And uh, I, before that, as Jasper comes to make her presentation on uh, designing TB case finding interventions for men using a participatory health seeking pathway, pathway analysis, uh, the IT, I hope her presentation is ready. I want to use this opportunity to welcome uh, back our uh, MDS that have finished a very important meeting on multi-sector accountability framework for TB. And we look forward to the commitments, recommendations from that uh, sideline meeting. I also want to use this opportunity to wel welcome none other than our advocate our senior member, the Honorable uh, Chairperson of the TB Caucus, uh, Honorable Joel Sebikari. We really welcome you in this meeting today and uh, representing members of parliament that are around. Thank you for joining us this morning and honoring this occasion. Uh, over to you, Jasper, if your presentation is ready. And then we shall quickly move into uh, some questions and answers. Um, thank you, Raymond, and thank you all. Good morning. Um, 
we pray today, but just a small joke. I hope the IT works well, so maybe we should add a prayer to the IT gods next time. So I'm presenting my work titled Designing TBK's Finding Interventions for Men in uh, Urban Healthcare Facilities, and this work was done under the Light Consortium. We have some information at the back just to tell you more about it. But um, in Uganda, we are focusing on gendered interventions in, in public healthcare facilities. So this work comes against the backdrop. Yeah. This work This work comes against the backdrop that the NTP has been doing over consecutive years, including the National Prevalence Survey, which was done in 2015, which showed that TB is four times more prevalent among men compared to women. And at the same time, we estimate that about two thirds of, almost, of all missed TB cases um, are among men. This year, thankfully, we have zero missed cases, but um, yeah, uh, way back, this was what we estimated. And missed TB cases are particularly important because they contribute to onward spread of TB within their communities, and estimates put this at between 5 to 15 people each year. So identifying missed TB people is an important global issue, and at the international level, even the UN high-level meeting has really emphasized um, the need to call for gendered interventions and gender equality, and recognize and address the specific needs um, and barriers to TB care among men. So last year, in this same meeting, we presented the GKP assessment, and right now um, the report is available. It's on the MLI. It's on the um, sorry, the the MOH website, so you can access it there. But just to summarize this gender work, um, the assessment was conducted to enable the program um, understand the extent and and uh, gendered barriers and facilitators to care in Uganda, and we employed mixed methods. We looked at the NTP data from a couple of years. We also went to um, a couple of DTUs and we collected, we reviewed the registers and collected prim primary data. We also conducted 97 key informant interviews and 47 and four focus group discussions, sorry. So ultimately, these results showed that men underutilized healthcare services and loss to follow up, particularly um, initial loss to follow up for MDRTB was important among women because we only had about 48% of them initiating TB treatment. And the report advocated for gender policies. When we look at the barriers to care, we found that stigma um, was an important barrier to care both among men and women, but the dimensions were a little bit different. Men were concerned about its impact on their social status and social activities. Well, for women, it was its association with HIV and, and, and its impact on their relationships. There was a quote up there from a woman who said, when I'm discovered to have TB, then my boyfriend will leave me or run away from me because he will conclude that this may not be um, TB alone. Then when we look at other barriers among men, um, men also feared um, that the time that they'd lose uh, and its impact on their uh, income, they found the, the working hours unfavorable, and there is this quote from another man, and I think this mostly applies to health center tools where he said, um, health centers not open long enough, health workers start at 10 and close by midday, and yet we arrive at 7 a.m. Lower health units apart from maternity units do not open on weekends and public holidays. So this just shows that currently the healthcare mix um, is more favorable towards women. And also um, one of the facilitators that our female participants reported is they are able to utilize immunization and maternity services as an entry point into TB care services. Um, other barriers among women included financial dependency and the need to seek permission. So based on this work, um, yeah, based on this work, we, cond we are conducting a study under the Light Consortium in which, with the aim to develop gender responsive TB case finding interventions targeting men attending urban public health facilities. Um, we are doing this work in Gombe, Mitiana, Kawolo, and Nakaseke um, hospitals. And we are using a participatory approach. Um, I think from the TB survivors and the presentations we've had, it's really um, important to engage community, so it's what we are doing. And um, this was done to facilitate co-production of a gender responsive intervention. So this is a staged process. We initially engaged 87 stakeholders. This included healthcare workers at this, at this study sites, TB survivors, uh, policy makers, 
um, from the NTP and researchers. Um, so we had formative data collection in each of these um, study sites, and we eventually had a final co-analysis meeting in which we were able to um, come up with the final solution or the final intervention package. So the methods that we used in the facility workshop in the four sites that I've mentioned is that we describe the steps that a TB patient, or that a person with TB, sorry, um, or a person with symptoms suggestive of TB takes from the onset of TB symptoms to the time when they're able to get the care that they need. So this was done in two groups. One group described the ideal pathway, what should happen, and the other group described what actually happened. So this group really looked at the lived experiences of people with TB. So we compared the actual and the ideal pathway, and um, we identified barriers and gaps from that. So that image shows some of, our, some of the work we did at the health facility with the discussion. And then this image just shows a pathway that I'll um, show later in the results. So the other method that we used to co-create the solution is called stepping stones. So we really try to use visual, visual uh, methods so that um, we, we could really engage um, the stakeholders in fruitful discussions and so that we could um, um, really maximize the time that we had with them. So the stepping stones method used a river that a person with TB needs to cross. So on one end, we have a person with TB and on the other end is, a, is what we want, um, a TB, person with TB identified and notified by the healthcare system. So using this, stakeholders were able to discuss solutions. So each stone represented a solution that will enable a person with TB cross from one end to the other. So we built a bridge using stepping stones and these stepping stones were eventually arranged in order of importance and we're also able to identify resources required and potential challenges so that what we'd um, co-create would be implementable. So this is just an example and we used a blue paper to be visual and actually represent a river. So these are our results. So this image shows uh, a pathway that, that we developed and I hope you can see it. And across all locations, we found that the actual TB care pathway differed from the ideal. And this may look like a typical, typical TB pathway, but when, you apply a, when we apply a gender lens and we look at the barriers that men face, we, not, we notice that that what we are seeing at the community level really ties in with these barriers. So men are primary income earners, and time spent at the healthcare facility and income loss was an important issue for them. And there are also misconceptions about TB. They also viewed public healthcare facilities as a place for women and children, as we mentioned, the service basket that's offered, lack of programs for men and long waiting times. And what we see in the co at the community level is them seeking um, healthcare services from religious and traditional healers, association of TB with um, witchcraft and other uh, things. They also self-medicate, uh, go to private uh, facilities and pharmacies and drug shops. So when we look at um, the lower level where we have these missed cases, uh, we see that sometimes referrals are not followed, sometimes in the health facilities there are missed opportunities for screening, and we also identified an important barrier that TB is not profitable, particularly in the private healthcare system. So when we look at the solutions that we co-created, other um, areas that the stakeholders thought would be priority areas, they emphasized healthcare worker training um, to, to really ensure that all patients who come to the healthcare facilities are screened for TB so that we can reach our 100% target, um, patient health education, particularly to dispel myths and misconceptions on TB, integrated TB services at all, at all care entry points, male responsive services, and the engagement of private health uh, providers. So when we look at the outputs, the outputs will sorry, the overall outcome. The overall outcome that we decided was improved access to TB screening and care for men presenting at healthcare facilities with, an, with the ultimate in, impact of reduction in missed TB cases among men. So in conclusion, gender responsive strategies are needed to meet um, healthcare needs for TB diagnosis and treatment. And the participatory approach was particularly beneficial in, uh, in uh, creating this dialogue between multiple actors. Uh, there was a court there 
um, that the approach is everything and encouraged full participation for all. We're able to come up with a short list of gender responsive interventions and um, we are now piloting this intervention. We're completing data collection, uh, primary data collection this December and we'll be able to disseminate results on the acceptability, effectiveness and cost effectiveness of this male responsive response. And as I live, um, as I've done gender work, usually we are asked, why are you focusing on men? If you focus on men, will you leave out women? And I'd just like to emphasize, we are addressing barriers to care for men, women, and children, but prioritizing areas that address barriers that are um, important to men so that we can bring them onto care and reduce the burden of, of Ms. TB. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jasper. Don't go very far. Uh, can I call upon all those that presented to join me here at the podium? As they join me, can I have the men standing? Can I have all men standing? Now when I see all men standing and I see the women seated, I realize we are yet to be gender balanced. So can I hear the women say, Nay. Okay, can the men sit and the women stand? Can I see the women standing, the ladies? Can I? So you can see the gender balance in the room, but I do know that it is very important that we have our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, here, they are the ones who make sure that our health is okay. And now this time I'm also seeing the men getting involved and engaged. So even the men, we thank you very much, but we want to appreciate the ladies in the room. Thank you, ladies. Thank you very much. So I have, and, and are there any children in the room? Are there any children in the room? And I saw a child outside there, so we also want to appreciate the children. They are the ones who are educating us. The, 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 the educators of our communities in terms of TB, we need to put emphasis also on our children. Uh, Dr. Maureen, please join, yeah, join us at the podium. So I want us to have a few minutes of questions, uh, clarifications, and comments. If we could take maybe about... 20 minutes, so that, so that we can have a cup of coffee and then come for the second session. I'm told around 10 minutes. So, so those, those who have questions for clarification, to any of them, please, uh, Kato and uh, the, other t the others who have the microphones, Please raise your hand so that you, you make your comment. And it should be as short, as sweet, as beautiful, and as sounding as possible. So that we can have a number of them. Start with that table there, Kato, where you are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, team, once again, good morning, colleagues. Uh, I thank God who has kept us up to this day. Yuta Dodiog is my name. I serve in Seredi's law government, Kagwara Health Center 3. Once again, I'm the in charge. I want to honor and uh, appreciate the individual or the team that came up with this CAST program. Surely, there are results that we are appreciating and we are celebrating through CAST. I have a suggestion, if possible, around the funds can be available in facilities. We have hotspot areas, where if you look at your catchment area, there are areas where TB comes from, maybe a given sub-county or a given village. If there are some funds that can be available, we can facilitate these health workers to do hotspot screening. We may not be able to wait for the digital x-ray or even a mobile van, but we can use these very VHTs in those villages. Then we do screening. Something, something related to TB contact tracing, something like that. But this one will be a community screening. If that fund can be available or that support, 
we shall be ready and willing to go and do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very good strategy as we move forward into how do we decentralize further the CAST-TB using data. Uh -huh. Another quick comment or question? Uh, uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, good morning once more. My name is um, Aluma Jovin Njama. I work with the Uganda Catholic Medical Bureau that is under BMZ project. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Aldo and uh, Dr. Biaro Hanga. Uh, as we looked at the, the, the presentation for the, for the uh, uh, digital x-rays that were procured, that is by the, by the Minister of Health previously, when we looked at the data, you realize that there is a lot that has been done, but of course, we also have challenges. I myself have been one of the radiographers working in the mobile trucks and also in the, bus, in the, in the backpacks. So one of the challenges which I've realized is uh, the support to the, to the mobile, uh, mobile, bus, uh, mobile uh, digital x-rays, especially which have been stationed to the different uh, health facilities, the support has really been limited. And in any case, if NTLP can help us and also support uh, the mobile uh, digital x-rays, then it will be okay. I'm not meaning the mobile clinics. And then also, uh, with the x-ray data, we have realized that uh, there are very many uh, TB cases uh, who were not identified, but this time around they have got uh, complications of of TB, there are very many people who are living with T, uh, who, who have complications of, of, of TB. I'm talking about uh, the post TB lung disease. So it has, it, has, it has been through X ray data that we have been able to realize some of these things. So the question still remains what can NTLP, that is a reputable organization, what can they do towards uh, such people? We have very many of them who are moving with even one lung. But the question is, the x-rays have, uh, have now shown us that such people do exist in the community. What can we do? Thank you very much. Very, very, very interesting uh, question. Support to the mobile x-ray uh, In BDBD refugee settlement, Yumbe, I have a few questions on the integrated CAST Plus campaign. Um, in the recently concluded campaign in September, we faced quite a number of challenges, uh, basically on the timing of the activity. By the time it got to us, the month was ending and uh, we had to do the acting TB activities into uh, this PhD budget. I know it is small, but I think it is where we, uh, it's an area we could explore and uh, have some activities uh, implemented under PHC. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, our brother from the refugee settlement team, Piribiri. Um, thank you, Chair. I thank you, Kato, for finally seeing me. I have uh, one question and one comment. My question is to the Cast Plus. So. Uh, Robert, uh, passionate at community level, and we do appreciate your comment. And the question will be answered. Yes, uh, Simon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have two issues to, to forward to you. One, uh, our last presenter here, she put it very clearly that uh, TB is not profitable in the private facilities. Uh, to my observation, I've worked with hospitals. I think Mr. Chair has shared with you some data. They do diagnose a lot of TB, those private ones. And uh, I think we wouldn't be discouraged. We need to bring them on board because they are very good at case finding. But again, we need to motivate them 
to take TB as one of the priority area when they are serving the community. Remember, most of our people start within the... Especially... So as we develop the interventions, we have to be deliberate so that the interventions are specific. And depending on how we even develop the packaging, how we package the information, because whereas, because from the report she mentioned that most of the women were being screened when... You're asking? I'm asking Dr. Aldo. Oh, okay. And Dr. Jasper Nidoy. Okay. Yes. Oh, continue. So to Dr. Aldo, you talked about bacteriologically confirmed. What is that? The other thing you talked about was presumed TB. What is that? Is it, is it a new type of TB? Then, Dr. Jasper, you talked about DTUs. What are DTUs? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Simon, for making sure that people clarify some of the terminologies before the communities. Yes. Uh, here, Kato. Here in front. Hey, okay. Thank you, Chair. My name is Amusango Sari, Minister of ICT and National Guidance. Unfortunately, I came when the person who was presenting, I didn't hear his name. But the person who mentioned about public education airtime, which is being controlled by the other disease, when we feel that, when we hear that it is moving on well, we feel happy and we are proud of the other disease. If there are those other, other, other districts which are also having problems, please, you get to us, and then we see how we can do it. I also, this is to encourage this stakeholders' engagement that we have a digital transformation roadmap. You know we are digital, but most of the things now are being digitalized. So if we embrace the, four pillar, the five pillars of digital transformation, it will take us a long way to improve service delivery, especially managing time and distance. Thank you. Thank you very much for the contribution from ICT in terms of this is part of what we are looking at in multi-sector accountability. Uh, over to Dr. Ebo. I thought Raymond, you had forgotten my name. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I, I hope you are not going to ask me questions where, who, who am I? Whom am I trying to address? Introduce yourself, to sir. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Nkolo Ebo. I'm, uh, I'm a senior technical advisor. I had to go through the titles to pick the right one. I'm a senior technical advisor for URC. I work with URC based in Maryland, and I'm based in Uganda. And I used to work also around the TB program for some time since 2004. So I've been listening uh, since the beginning of the workshop yesterday, and I would like to applaud the team for the good efforts that the team has done. Really, you have taken the, uh, the, 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 the mantle where it belongs. You have taken it above. And first of all, to thank the leadership of the Minister of Health, but also Dr. Stavia for steering the team and making sure that things happen and happen well together with the partners and the districts. Now, uh, one of the things is uh, the custody, and they are taking it everywhere. And I wanted uh, to say before it goes, because I know it is going out of even the country to, to other countries, before it goes, can we target those districts, the poorly performing districts that we were showed yesterday? Can we concentrate on them and we make sure that we boost them and they are able to identify more uh, 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 diseases, uh, more, more TB and, and other things. Then uh, the analysis, I think we have drilled more on descriptive analysis. We now need to move to inferential statistics and probably, probably predictive analysis. We have described, 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 yes. Can we move and we start predicting what is going to happen in the future. 
because if we have detected all the TB cases, we are making sure the treatment success rate is high, then we need to predict. ECBSS, I think, needs to be scaled up. Uh, the other things were about uh, community systems. I think TB has a, a strong community system. It had gone down uh, uh, around, uh, I think, a few years ago, but it has come back again. Can we integrate this with the Ministry of Health uh, community system? I hear they have launched a new strategy. In the spirit of integration, can we do this? There's something I've not heard about in diagnosis. I heard it at uh, the union conference. Things to do with whole genome sequencing and targeted genome sequencing. If you are going to t detect TB at a different level and uh, do surveillance and other things, we need to start talking about these things. And I know Professor Joloba is coming, probably will be talking about that. Uh, TB Info is a very good system. I think as the cast presenter presented, it has done a great job. Again, we need to integrate it with a community system that uh, is coming. And then almost uh, lastly, I think we need to rethink about how we are getting our indices for TB. Because wherever we touch the TB prevalence survey indices, it seems like, no, you can't touch them. They don't belong at lower level. They belong at higher rev level. Can we rethink how we are getting The evidence we are presenting when we were at Union Conference, we are able to see a number of presentations. And even in this conference, I don't know whether it is the next session, but we need to see some of this data being linked to, the, um, to what we are doing, because the academia sometimes have a lot of data. But where is this data for us to be able to link it to that? So, Chair, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I would like to stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Ebo. I think, uh, Ebo, you've mentioned quite very interesting areas and very good remarks and good recommendations on what we really need to do. I will want now to turn it back to the team. I want to turn it back to my colleagues, the panel. Those who have comments or questions, please write them down and uh, we will see how we will respond to them. Or if you have specific to specific people during the tea break, just get in touch with them and see how they can uh, answer those comments. So I'll turn it back to the team. I don't know, Maureen, whether you have any question that was for you. I would want you to look at the integrating with the child health days. How, how possible is it to? Um, yes, thank you very much for, for that. Uh um, comment and indeed uh, the conversation has started at the Ministry of Health and uh, we shall uh, be able to provide updates the TB program reached out to the um, to the UNEPI um, section and MCH and uh, we hope that uh, the discussions will be fruitful so the conversation has started regarding ICCM what I know is that um, if you looked at the cur current chat booklet that the VHTs are using in the context of ICCM, there's actually a component on TB which was uh, incorporated um, about, uh, about four, four, four years ago. So we, we leveraged that. So I think the, the issue now is uh, actual implementation. So if these VHTs are providing the, the service under ICCM, why is it that they are only considering the malaria component and yet TB and HIV are part of the, the chat booklet? If you look at the questions for TB, uh, we do have, um, is, is, the chi is there a, a household uh, TB exposure? And then for HIV, is there a risk for HIV? And uh, the VHT ideally, um, should be able to tick on, on that chart that they use to capture the information. And uh, also within the ICCM VHT register, there is a component on TB. So maybe to understand the operational issues on why it is selective implementation of the malaria section. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Over to Aldo. Aldo, you had some interesting questions. You can uh, take them on. That uh, any participants who probably uh, could have felt uncomfortable with the terms, uh, which were not explained well, maybe I will just say, uh, presumably, uh, this is, uh, I would say, probable or possible TB. So it's like we have noted, we are noted very sure if there's TB, but uh, yeah, it's the terminology which we use. Yeah, we call it suspected TB, but uh, now we call it presumed, uh, meaning that you, you possibly have TB, and it, is a, it requires you to do further investigations to, uh, to uh, confirm TB in that person. So I apologize for that term. Then uh, for bacteriologically confirmed TB, this is now TB which has been identified using a, a laboratory test. Uh, the common laboratory tests are the usual microscope, and now there are other uh, tests which have come on board, like we keep talking about the gene expert and many others. So those ones identified the, uh, the, the, the germ, so we're able to say that this is now confirmed TB in the laboratory, and we call it bacteriologically confirmed TB. So uh, just in line with the other question which came from Simon over here, the other Simon, who asked if uh, chest X-ray can, why we don't confirm TB with chest X-ray, and, and why we use gene expert. So it is the same explanation. Chest X-ray does not uh, identify the TB germ. It identifies abnormalities in the chest due to TB disease. So it will only tell you that you possibly have TB. So we can say you have presumpt, uh, presumptive TB based, in, based, based on chest X-ray. So it triggers the healthcare worker to do further investigations to confirm the disease using a laboratory test. So we use either microscopy or gene pattern or any other tests to confirm the TB in the laboratory. Uh, but the chest X-ray is used for screening and identify people who possibly have TB. However, as a clinician, sometimes when the laboratory test does not find the TB, uh, you use a combination of, of other signs and symptoms of disease and use the evidence from the X-ray abnormality to make a this clinical decision. So those are now the healthcare workers who are trained to diagnose TB who can take such a decision to treat TB based on chest X-ray abnormality. But doesn't mean that the TB has been confirmed.